Good morning, guys. When the, ch- when the children leave, it suddenly le- seems if only half of us are left. Won't you... Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Okay, now I see the positive spin now. Okay, so firstly, we, we are starting off this morning by saying congratulations. I feel a bit like a talk show host this morning. So to all of you and to all of you at home, even if you're tuned in online, congratulations, and this is why... I'm going to tell you in a moment. Turn to the person next to you and say, congratulations. Absolutely. And why is that? Because if you are here this morning or if you are tuned in this morning, I love this, you are tuned in this morning, a faith to rank of you, uh, that means that you have beaten the worst pandemic known to mankind in the last 70 years. We are alive. Lights, photo. Now, if you are seated next to your wife, please proceed. I'm serious. I'm watching you. I'm expecting a dip. There we go. There we go. Lovely. Great start. So this morning we're talking about reclaiming our lives by living it. So in case you haven't been with us for the last couple of weeks or so, I'm, I'm doing a series, I'm probably landing it with this, reclaiming our lives from what was stolen the last, last year or two from us. And so um, this morning is reclaiming our lives by living it. Can I have the second photo and lights, please? There's only two, but it will it'll end after this. You get that? The idea is to die young as late as possible. Okay, so, you see, the reason is growing old still beats the alternative of of dying young, in my book in any event. So, um, loving life and living it in full color is an ability and a choice that we each have each day. And the great news is that we can and should be making this choice independently from our circumstances, completely independently of what the world says. You do not have to be perfectly healthy or wealthy or really good looking. In spite of what social media tells you. In this week, um, I popped into the coffee shop at the back and somebody said something that uh, looked like someone, I think it was Tilly Savalas or something. In any event, I said, no, he looks like me. And then I said, just like um, Richard Gere kind of looks like Sean. And there's this lady in the coffee shop, she said, can I meet Sean? <laughs> I said, no, he, he's, he's out, but his wife, Dini, is standing right there. You should have seen the color on her. I hope she's not here. Okay, in any event... <laughs> And, and when, I, when I say that, that it's a choice that we can make, we don't have to be perfectly healthy, wealthy, or, or good-looking. It's a choice. Then it's not brainless mind over matter stuff. Actually, it just needs a new perspective on life, a kingdom perspective on life. Dion, it's so good to see you. Why don't you stand? Three weeks? Two weeks ago, Dion had a massive heart attack, and since he had four stents put into his heart and his ear. That is grabbing hold of life. Well done, Butch. So the abundant life in Jesus and the abundant life that Jesus promised starts here. As soon as we choose to live the life that he died to give us. When we choose to live that life, our abundant life can start. You see, as Christians, we often say and declare that we believe in life after death, which is wonderful. But we kind of sometimes forget to believe in life before death. This part is also fun. I think it's a lot of fun. 
Because I love the Bible. But there's one specific verse that kind of bothers me. I'll tell you because it's not in the, it's, okay, it's not in the notes, but I'll just drift there quickly. It's the one where Jesus says, in the afterlife there will be no marriage or given into marriage. You see, you know what that means. So enjoy this life. Okay, let's move on. It's, it's, we, we grab hold of life. And when we choose to see God in the small details of life, when we see Him in the small details of life, you know, expecting a greater experience of Him everywhere, every day. Because a greater expectation of God, not a greater demand or presumptuousness, but a greater expectation leads to greater experience of God and of life. I thought that was good. Delighting myself in life is definitely an activity. It is not passive. It is, not, it is seriously deliberate. It is passionate. It is intentional. It is a mindset. It is an attitude. So who here knows a friend of mine by the name of Clint Perring? Most of you know him. Clint is married to Fran, and they were in eldership with us before uh, they moved to Cape Town. Um, by the way, that guy on the motorbike, die young as late as possible. That is a prophetic photo of Clint Perring at 85. Okay. Now, you see, don't, don't be fooled and think that he has this life of leisure and pleasure and that he does nothing, although he does a lot of surfing and all sorts of fun and great things. He lives a fairly stressful life, and he runs a high-demand company over three continents. And yet, the thing that I love about Clint is that he grabs hold of life by the throat, and he squeezes life until life turns either blue or red in the face, because he refuses to live a beige life. He refuses to let life happen to him. I love people like that. I love hanging out with people like that because they inspire me. They inspire me for life. They inspire me for more. More of what? More of life and more of God. And you see, that's the only way. We, we have to understand that God is the author, He is the giver of life. And the only way that we can this morning say, I want more of life, basically is saying, I want more of God. It's impossible to find and to grab hold of more of life outside of grabbing hold of more of God. So here's a proviso or one of those T's and C's which you should take note of. When you decide this morning, and I trust you will, that you are going to go hard after life, that you want to reclaim your life and you want to live life, be wise as to what you add in and what you take out of in order to get hold of more life. Because only you will only be able to find more life in more of God. And sometimes people cut the wrong stuff in order to find more of life. There's no more life in less God. Let's move on. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. I have come, John 10, 10, second part, and have life in all of its abundance. Overflowing life is the generous gift of God, overflowing with more of God which does not mean or does not necessarily mean overflowing with more stuff. More stuff that I acquire and then I have to use it. I have to maintain it. I have to work harder to pay it off. I start resenting it. I start neglecting it. I start to, to kind of want to replace them and then eventually I replace them and I, I get some money so I buy more stuff. No, no. What I mean about the abundant life. I'm talking about the abundant life that Jesus came to give us. So, so when I read the Gospels, and I'm not quite sure the same is true for you, I wish that I could have been there. 
I don't always just want to read it 2,000 years too late, in a sense. It's never too late. But 2,000 years after the fact. I want to actually have been there. I want to have lived in it. I want to walk those dusty streets with Jesus. And at that moment where he said, I came that you may have life and have it in all of its fullness. I want to, to see and experience some of the, the miracles. I want to be present. You see, that's what I'm talking about. That is the abundant life. A God-filled life. Not just a filled life with stuff, but a fulfilled life. Not a life filled with all sorts of stuff that needs more responsibility and leads to more stress. And, just, and, and, and yet, the life of Jesus definitely wasn't a life of ease or life of, of comfort, or of splendor. But just to have a single day with him, wouldn't that be awesome? A single day to walk with Jesus and his disciples. Let, let, let's say it, it turned out to be a bit of a nothing day. Just a walking day. You arrive there, somehow they figure out the way to time travel, and you, you're there, and you find yourself walking with Jesus and the disciples, and you say, well, what's going to happen today? No, 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 nothing really. We, we, it's a walking day. We, we're traveling from Bethsaida to Capernaum. It's cool. Let's walk. No crowds. No teaching. No miracle. Just Jesus hanging out. Wouldn't that be awesome? That is the abundant life. I don't need anything else. I don't need anything more. And this is the clincher, especially now that we, we're praying for a lot of stuff during our fasting. I'm not going to do that. But anything else, anything more, any extras, any added benefits to just walking with Jesus en route is purely by his extravagant grace, goodness, and kindness towards us. That, walking with Jesus, that is the abundant life. Anything else, anything more, anything added, any extra benefits en route is purely because of His abundant grace, just because of who He is. I'm going to give you a, a quick, but I think profound quote by a man, Abram Joshua. No, known Abram, and I've known Joshua, but I don't know this guy. In any event, he says, the perception, or I've just put in brackets because the awareness. He says, the perception of the awareness of the glory is a rare occurrence in our lives. We fail to wonder. We fail to marvel. We fail to respond to the presence. This is the tragedy of every man, to dim all wonder by indifference. He says, life is routine, and routine is resistance to wonder. Callous indifference is the root of all sin. Quite profound. So I should be clear that delighting myself in life, grabbing hold of life, has nothing to do with selfish, lavish living. In fact, as soon as I, I stop living, delighting myself, and, and stop living in a way that is a life, a personal life on mission. As soon as I stop living a personal life on mission, I actually turn myself inward and I start to look inward, some navel gazing, and I start to exclude all the color, all the light, and all the majestic wonder of the outside world. The wonderful thing about life is that life is to be lived outside. Outside of my personal space, outside of these walls, outside of my personal preferences, outside of my comforts. 
Let's quickly look at Luke chapter 5. A couple of verses from verse 17, a really, really well-known portion. One day, he, Jesus, was teaching Pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And they were sitting and listening, and the power of the Lord was present for him to heal. Some men, I love that it just simply says some men, came carrying a paralytic on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd packing, they went up onto the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the house and into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. So there's a number of things we can say about that, and um, I'm quite sure that you've all heard a sermon on this before. One of the interesting things is, is for me is that it says that when Jesus saw their faith, he said to him, you're healed. Your sins are forgiven. In any event, I'm not going to preach on this. I'm just mentioning this because I want to make one point, and it's not profound at all. It's simply going to point out the very obvious. And the very obvious is that these, these men, friends, possibly, but you know when you, 2,000 years ago, lying in the dust as a paralytic for years, I don't think you have that many friends. So probably family, whoever they were, friends or family, these men also had lives and responsibilities. Maybe, maybe they wanted to get to Jesus. Maybe they wanted to come to the meeting. Maybe they wanted to get there early. So maybe they got a hold of him really early that morning. I'm just assuming there's four of them. There's one corner of the mat each, kind of. If it was me, it was, you know, six guys. Okay. Any event, so there's four or six, however many. And um, I, I can just imagine these guys carrying this, uh, their, their friend towards the place that they anticipate Jesus will be teaching. And, um, and they, they're ahead of the pack. They're ahead of the crowd that we're going to get there. We're going to get there first. And every now and then, now because the switch is kind of, you know, it looks more like a hammock, uh, the guy's back is, is in agony, so they have to rest him. And, and people are catching up, and people are passing by. And, and then they, they're picking up, and they, they go for it again. And then they start to sweat, and it runs down, and they start to lose their grip, and, and they have to put him down again and just catch their breath. And more and more people are getting by and passing by them, to the point that, as we know, by the time they get there, it's completely packed, and they can't even get close to Jesus. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe they had their own pressing business issues to attend to. Maybe they just had a, a day full with things that required their attention, just stuff that needed to be done, a full day, just like us. But these four, I'm, saying, I'm guessing, they went, they went beyond that. They allowed somebody else's problem to become their inconvenience. They took somebody else's problem upon themselves and made that their inconvenience because they lived life on mission. This is as simple as it is, to live life on mission for an hour or two, and it changed their lives forever. Yes, sure, he got healed, but it definitely changed their lives by living on mission, by just opening up for a moment. 2,000-year-old story. Is it still relevant? Forgive me as I quickly read a testimony. During some of the darkest days of my life, a friend arranged for me to fly to Wisconsin, where I would learn a couch for four days of worship therapy. I was laid in front of a large stone fireplace with orange coals crackling in front of me, and behind me, the sounding board of Jason Upton's piano resounding at my back, my ears worn by the sounds of four musicians loving their God. They reminded me of the friends who tore away the roof tiles and lowered the paralytic to the Lord Jesus for a healing encounter. As the boys played and sang, they created space for Jesus to touch me. 
to speak tenderly to me. Numbness gave away to cleansing tears. I was granted real reprieve from anxiety and given solace for despair. I even rediscovered a long-lost belly laugh. Wives and kids would drift in and out with choice foods and buckets of life, flooding the fireplace studio with mirth until well past my bedtime. In those days, I experienced what theologians call imminence. Imminence, the nearness of God whose presence remains with us. The nearness of God whose presence lingers and hovers. We tasted the witness of Christ as a real person and as a living friend, spending time with his kids, and we knew it. It was so precious, and it came, rather, he came, with no requirements of hype or cajolting or groveling on our part. Our God is not some elusive storm on the horizon to be wrangled. Our God is not some elusive storm on the horizon to be wrangled. There is nothing aloof about our Abba that would, that would require the newer barlism that attends so much of our Christian striving. It is we, not God, who are lost and need to be found. And we are being found by Him daily. Imminence happens when we awake to the one who is perpetually knocking on the door of fellowship. This is by, written by a, a guy named Brad Jersak. He's also an author. So I include this testimony, this story, for the simple reason that it's a beautiful example of reclaiming life. Reclaiming life. Yes, the life of the one who wrote this, Brad. But once again also for the four musicians, the wonder of reclaiming life through their gift and through their gift, through their sacrifice, turning their sacrifice into the privilege of seeing God restore life. Of God breathing life again. Who has seen the movie Narnia? Please watch Narnia if you haven't seen it. To the end, to the end of the movie, Aslan comes into the, the castle of the White Witch, and there are all these frozen animals, because she's frozen them, and he breathes over them. Can you, can you remember that scene? And as he breathes over them, they melt and come back to life, or the, the ice comes off them and they come back to life. Just that's the picture I get when he speaks of restoring. Let's conclude. Reclaiming my life by living it is or does not involve any self centered unplugging from reality. Rather, it happens when I boldly go outside of my comfort bubble. When I boldly pop my own comfort bubble. When I willfully regard my marriage as a covenant, a holy covenant. When I see the heart of the Father God in the privilege of parenting. When I see my work as worship. When I choose to delight in the Father's blessing on somebody else's life. When I choose to delight in being the blessing in somebody else's life. When I delight in sharing this life and this journey with all of those that He's placed on this journey with me. Not in the notes, but a quote that I read somewhere or heard somewhere is, on life's journey, 
close the gates behind you. If you come from a farming community, you'll know how important it is to close the gates behind you. But in this context, it's close the gate on the stuff behind you. That disappointment, that business failure, that divorce, that whatever. Close the gate on what lies behind you as you journey further. We reclaim our life when we delight in the physical beauty of our surroundings. As we see the creativity and the power of God in nature. When we take a moment to just listen to the laughter of children. I think there's only Tanya's laughter that delights me more than the laughter of children. When you have that privilege of overhearing the conversation one day in that blanket tent. When you hear the, when you overhear the bedtime prayers. Then, last scripture. Then my heart and my soul cries out, Lord, what an awesome privilege I have to delight in this life. I choose to delight myself in you, Lord. I choose to delight in the abundance of life that you give. Psalm 16, 2, I said to the Lord, you are my God. Apart from you, I have no good thing. And so I choose to live my life as a celebration of his glory. I choose to live my life as a celebration of his glory.